All right. So, hey, how is everybody doing here today? Um, as most of you know me, for those that don't, my name is Steve Gornson with Action Coach Business Coaching here in Jacksonville. And uh, for those that are uh, might be watching on the recording version, the recorded version of this uh, webinar uh, down the road, right now we're actually in the middle of the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, so that might put some perspective on some of the, the my conversation and my comments. And, you know, right now we're all feeling the, uh, that we're really reeling over the effects of the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis on our, on our business. And, you know, as business owners, we all feel, and employees, we feel stressed out um, of, in various different ways. Um, and, and sometimes our, it's going off the chart. Uh, but the same really the same goes for our employees and, and the business owners and stuff. So it's really it's time for all of us to be um, is really is to be leaders so we can have a successful business and, and not only leading as in leading the company, but we, we need to lead um, the, the people we work with. We need to, to lead our clients or vendors and really be ahead of the game and and be the one with the plan. And we're not necessarily going to be um, talking about that today, but today we're going to be, uh, in this webinar, we're going to help you find out what your leadership style is, what your, what your leader language is. So I hope everybody has a pen and paper with you because I'm going to be taking you through some questions that at the end we'll talk about and have you'll have an idea of what your leadership language is. So. Uh, so make sure you go ahead and have that. Um, I'm just going to go on a little bit. And for those that don't know me, my, um, uh, I've owned and operated the Action Coach office here in Jacksonville for about the past 15 or 16 years. Um, it really is since 2004. And Action Coach is the world's largest coaching organization, over a thousand um, offices, 75 different countries around the world. And it's, it's my mission really is to help my clients work smarter, not harder, um, and really get their businesses working harder so that they don't have to. So hopefully that sounds really good to everybody out there. And what we do is when I'm working with business coaches, I mean, my business clients, I'm trying to help them sharpen their business intuition by showing them the factors and revealing to them the factors that really matter in their business that will make their business thrive. And it really how to create uh, high performance among themselves and the people around them by, by really working on solutions that matter. And today we're going to be talking about that leadership culture and how do you create that in your business. All right, so with that, uh, um, Sandra, you have your hand still up, so uh, take it down. But if you have a question, I will uh, unmute you and then we'll, uh, we'll go on from there. All right. So how do we define leadership? What is leadership? When we sit down and we look at it, I want everybody to, in the chat box in there, for those that, that are on right now, is how would you, you don't have to necessarily do that, but is, is how would you finish this sentence? A good leader should always blank. How would you fin finish that, se it, that, that sentence? Because you know, it, I, well, I'm not grading you on this, but it, it's really, it's how we answer this question is, is going to help us define and really unlock what our leadership style is, you know. And so, you know, before, uh, Patricia, empower their employees. I love, uh, I, I love that. So, you know, a good leader should always empower their employees. And we're going to see how that manifests itself into the different leadership uh, styles. So let's take a look at, before we really go in and analyze it, is what makes up a good leader. And, um, and before we sort of get in and assess your answers that we've had here, I'm, I'm going to share how a, um, the guy's name is Jage McGregor Burns. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning leadership expert, historian, he's a, a potential, uh, presidential biographer, political scientist, how he would define leadership. And, and, and I thought it was an interesting way and it sort of goes, it, it sort of rang true to me when I was looking up some of this stuff. And he says that a, a good leader is somebody that creates an inspiring vision of the future. 
a good leader is someone that motivates and inspires to engage people with that vision, right? We have to, is our vision has to enroll and engage our, uh, our employees or the people that we want to lead. Um, a good leader manages the delivery of that vision. And they also coach and builds a team so that they're more effective at delivering that vision. So, you know, as I always say, as, as a leader leads people, a manager manages things. And, and, there, and that's sort of where the, the, the difference is. So when we sit down and, and we look at this is, you know, anyone who strives to be a leader should always be changing and improving based on the information that they learn and the, what their followers need from them. Because as a leader, we're serving and helping our, the, the, the people that are following us, that we're there to serve them in a way. They're not there to serve us. And, and some managers or some leaders that have that, we're going to talk about a little bit about who has that idea of, of leadership. But the longer you act as a leader, the more likely it is that you'll change the way you choose to complete that sentence, possibly, of a good leader should always boom. Because in order for us to grow as a leader, we first need to know where you, are, where you stand as one. And so what we're going to do first is we're going to break down how you answer that question. and then. Once we're going to ask you a, a series of questions, and just all you have to do is, is just sort of make a couple of little notes on a, on a sheet of paper. And then at the end, we're going to see how that defines, there's like six different leadership styles that we'll go to, go through. So uh, it's time to begin the test. So hopefully everybody sit down and ready. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by diving into a short survey that was uh, developed by leadership uh, expert and, uh, and professor, his name is Bill Tobert, uh, along with his partner who is a psychologist, Susan Carter Gruger. Um, and and this, this is called the leadership profile or development profile. And it's gonna help us to determine our leadership, which one, what, uh, it'll help us determine our leadership style that we uphold based on what they call our action logics, or I call leadership behaviors that we, most, that we agree with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna sort of pose out different uh, leadership behaviors, and I want you to write down uh, which ones that you agree with most. So grab your pen and paper, and when I read one of these statements that you agree with, um, I want you to write down the letter and the number combination. So there'll be an S1, an A3, and then we'll go back and we'll decipher what all that means afterwards. Uh, because at the end, we'll determine what your leadership, uh, what your answers say about you as a leader as well. And keep in uh, mind the categories that we're gonna come up with first uh, and that the statements, the way they're organized don't necessarily relate to the outcome and you'll see that as we move forward. So is everybody ready to get started? Here we go. All right. So our the, the first one that we're going to talk about is uh, of leadership is an individualist. So an individualist leader is self-aware. They're creative and primarily focused, but on their own actions as opposed to the overall organizational performance. They are exceptionally driven by the desire to exceed personal goals and constantly improve upon their skills. So here are some statements that an individualist leader might agree with, all right? So which the ones that you agree with, um, I'm gonna, these are gonna be either A1, A2, or A3, and I want you to just write down which ones that you are. So the first one is, uh, is actually I1. So I1 is a good leader should always trust their own intuition over the established organizational processes. Excuse me. All right, so that was I1, a good leader. Um, will always trust their own intuition over established organizational processes. I too, it's important to be able to relate to others so I can easily communicate complex ideas to them. So again, this is I too. It's important to be able to relate to others so I can easily communicate complex ideas to them. And then the third one comes out to is I three, 
and I'm more comfortable with progress than sustained success. So again, I'm more comfortable, <coughs> excuse me, with progress than sustained success. All right, so everybody, hopefully you got one, two, or, or possibly none of that. That is fine. That will, that'll take us through and help you. All right, so that's the, the, the first area that we're going to look at. So now we're going to look at the strategist. Here the strategists are extremely aware of their environments in which they operate. Um, they make it a point to gather deep understandings of, of structures, processes that make their businesses tick, but also they're able to keep perspective, apply critical thinking, and evaluate what needs to or what can be approved. All right, so that's a sort of a summary there. So let's take a look at these three um, different statements or, or leadership behaviors. And again, they don't necessarily have to attune to the strategist, but which ones tend to um, uh, uh, just ring true to you. So the first one is S1, is a good leader should always be able to build a consensus in a divided groups. Again, S1 is a good leader should always be able to build consensus within divided groups. All right, now we're gonna go to uh, S2. S2, it's important to help develop an organization as a whole in addition to the growth of individuals. So again, I'm gonna read S2 again. It's important to help develop an, uh, an organization as a whole in addition to growth of individuals. All right, everybody's there. Hopefully, you're, if you have any questions or whatever, raise your hand and um, I'll slow down or, or, um, or, or, or answer. I'll put your mic on and uh, you can ask some questions. Then we have um, the third question here is S3, is conflict is inevitable, but I know enough about my team's personal and professional relationship to handle the friction. Again, S3, conflict is inevitable, but I know enough about my team's personal and professional relationships to handle that friction. All right, so we've got the first couple down the road. I think we've got like three more of these to go. So the, the, the next one, whoop, going backwards, is the alchemist. So what distinguishes an alchemist from other leadership behaviors that they possess is their unique ability to see the big picture in everything you know, while also understanding the need to take details very seriously. So this type of leadership, no department or employee is overlooked. So here are some statements that an alchemist leader might agree with. Which ones do you do? So first, A1, a good leader helps their employees reach their highest potential and possesses the necessary empathy and moral awareness to get there. I'm gonna read that again. A1 as a good leader helps their employees reach their highest potential and possesses the necessary empathy and moral awareness to get there. All right, if you, if that, if you agree with that, hit uh, write down A1. A2, it's important to make a profound and positive impact on whatever I am working on. It is important to make a profound and positive impact on whatever I am working on. And finally, the last one here, A3, is I have a unique ability to balance short-term needs and long-term goals. I will repeat that. A3, I have a unique ability to balance short-term needs and long-term goals. All right, I believe we only have about three more of these to go. All right, and then we'll, we'll delve into what all this means. So the next one that we have is our opportunist. The opportunists are guided by a certain innate level of mistrust in others and rely on a, on, a, on a facade of control to keep their employees in line. So these type of leaders usually believe in the adage, an eye for an eye is maybe the best way to sort of say it. So here's maybe some things that an opportunist uh, might say. A good leader should always view others as a potential competition to be bested, even if it's at the expense of their personal development. Again, Q, uh, O1, a good leader should always view others as a potential competition 
to be bested, even if it's at the expense of their own personal development. All right, now we're gonna to go to O2. I reserve the right to reject the input of those questions or criticize my ideas. So again, O2, I reserve the right to reject the input of those who question or criticize my ideas. All right, so let's move on. Next one is the diplomat. So here we're looking at the diplomat. So the diplomat is not necessarily concerned with assuming control. Instead, they seek to cause minimal impact by conforming to existing norms and, and completing their tasks within with as little frish, uh, friction as possible. They don't like the rock in the boat, I guess. So here might some things that a diplomat might say, which one of these hold true to you? And again, if you don't have any, if you if you could have none of these could hold true to you or just one, two or all three, that's fine. It doesn't make a difference. All right, so uh, this is D1. D1 is a good leader should always resist change since it risks causing instability. D1, a good leader should always resist change since it its risk causes instability. So that was D1. Now we're gonna go down to D2. D2 is it's important to provide the social glue in a team situation. So always be able to, to move them safely away from conflict. So D2, it is important to provide the sort of social glue in, in team situations, bringing them together to be able to move them safely away from conflict. That's D2. D3, I tend to thrive in more team-oriented or supportive leadership roles. Again, D3, I tend to thrive in more team-oriented or supporting leadership roles. Then we go into the expert. This will be the last one, and then we're going to delve into this a little bit more deeply. So what uh, the expert, let me move that slide along. The expert is always at the front of the uh, line in their field, and they continuously strive to perfect their knowledge and meet their own, their own personal high expectations. The expert is fantastic as a contributor and a source of knowledge, but can't usually, um, but uh, but can usually stand to improve in areas where, uh, in the field of emotional intelligence. So they have the content, but they always can't put it into the right context. They sort of know what should be said, but they don't say it in the right way at that right moment. Maybe that's a good way of putting it. So here's a. Uh, a couple of statements from the from the expert and let me know which one of these hold true to you. So E1, E1 is a good leader should prioritize their own pursuit of knowledge over the needs of the organization and their direct reports. Again, E1, a good leader should prioritize their own pursuits of knowledge over the needs of the organization and their direct reports. And then next, E2, is when problem, when problem solving with others in the company, my opinion tends to be the correct one. I like that one, no. Is, uh, E2, is when problem solving with others in the company, my opinion tends to lead to, uh, to be the correct one. Isn't that an interesting statement? So which one of these, okay, so I, uh, hopefully you have them all down. And what we're going to do is we're now going to take a look at what leaders are you. So take a look at your notes. And then as I go through these, we're gonna break, it, we'll be breaking it down into um, uh, really is it six, seven different leadership categories. and. Um, what you'll find is as you circle them, you'll find out which ones you tend to be the, uh, which will be connect you to what your leadership style is. So the more statements that you agree with, the more likely you practice a sort of a mixed leadership style. Um, and then sort of this is sort of how we break it down. If we uh, take a look at this, um, if we have a, a democrat, if you're more of a democratic, you're gonna agree with S3. The autocratic leader tends to be 
O1, O2, E1, E2. Laissez-faire, D2, D3, and so on and so forth. So if you agree with everything the strategist said, um, like S1, S2, and S3, this would make you sort of a 66% uh, strategic leader because the strategic leader is, that's two out of the three categories there, but then also 33% of a democratic leader, if that makes sense. Right. So I, when I went through and, and sort of, I tended to be mostly within a, a strategic and a transformational leader. And we didn't talk about transformation. We're going to go through each one of these and take a look at what their strengths are. So um, just sort of a, a raise of hands. Have you guys figured out which, um, which one of these actually, just raise your hand if, if you've sort of figured out what your basic leadership styles are? Yes or no? Just raise your hand. You can just raise your hands. Yes, no? All right. So we all with me here. All right. Very good. I appreciate that. Okay, interesting. All right. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one is our demo democratic leadership. You know, so, so for those that fall into the category of democratic leadership, you're going to be happy to hear that this style is really is commonly very effective. So these types of leaders make decisions based on the input of each team member. And you know, although the leader makes the final call, each employee has an equal say in the project's direction. So, so democratic leadership is also one of the most effective styles because it allows lower level employees to exercise some authority, which gives them some more skin in the game, generally makes them a little bit more loyal to the company as a whole. But, um, but there is maybe some issues that solving an issue under a democratic leadership resembles how decisions might be made in a board meeting uh, where uh, the leader gives the team a few dis decision related options. There's an open discussion held on each one. And then the, the leader makes a decision based on the input of everybody at hand. So that works in a, in, in only in certain environments. So, so that's the democratic leadership. So if you were a democratic leader, if that's, those are things that you need to sort of sit down and look at. The autocratic leadership. So this is very, this is the very opposite of the democratic leadership. Autocratic leadership is rarely effective in the long term, but sometimes it's necessary. So in this leadership style, employees are neither considered or consulted prior to a direction and are expected to, to adhere to a decision at a time and a place stipulated by the leader itself. So an example of, um, might be just like uh, if a manager changes uh, the, the work hours or work shifts or for multiple employees, but not telling anybody. So, you know, so they just boom, they just made the decision. So in today's workplace culture, this type of leadership can't be sustained over a long period of time because you're going to start losing employees. You know, if you fell under this leadership category, you need to uh, start working on possibly being a little bit more open to the intellect and the perspectives of the rest of the team. But now on the other hand, and, and basically you have to think about it, you don't have to go it alone. But on the other hand, when we sit down and looking at it, when, when we were in this crisis mode, sometimes people, this is where your autocratic leadership needs to step up because people are, they don't know what to do and boom, they're looking to follow a leader and say, hey, this is what you, we need to do right now. And once, once we get people working and get that flow going is what we, we needed in this crisis, well, okay, now, now we can go back and we've, we've minimized people's uh, fear and their anxiety. We got them working. We got them working towards something. And now we have to start to begin to work them towards something instead of just doing something. So the, the next type of leadership is called the laissez-faire leadership. I don't know if anybody learned uh, French in high school, but uh, this is sort of where it helps me out a little bit. Don't remember, but this is one term I, uh, that I do remember. But it basically, it, 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 literally, it means let them do. And, we, and this could refer to leaders who hand over nearly all the authority to their employees. 
And this sometimes works in, in certain situations and sometimes doesn't. The larger your organization is, then you're abdicating the, your responsibilities and things don't necessarily get done the way you want. They get done the way the employees want and we're all not working and moving towards the same direction. Uh, but, where, but where this leadership style could, could be effective is maybe if you're a young startup and where, you know, people might see this laissez-faire company founder who, you know, he's, there's really no office policies right to work around or deadlines. And he puts his trust in, in the, his employees that he has on hand because these are the people that are really helping him build the company right now. And so it allows him to focus on maybe bigger pictures of running the company and, and how to, and really how to get things off the ground. But as the company grows, this might be a, even though right now this can be very empowering for the employees, but it could limit their development or overlook critical growth opportunities within the company, or it can cause bottlenecks in the growth of the company because they're, um, uh, how did I say it before, it, it, it is because everybody's doing their own thing and nobody's working towards a common goal. Hopefully that makes sense the way I explained it there. So let's move on to the next leadership style. So strategic leaders, these people sit sort of at the intersection between the company's main operation and growth, op and growth opportunities. So this type of leader promotes a culture of inquiry, but also accepts additional burdens in the interest of, ins of ensuring consistency and stability for everyone else. So a strategic leader is constantly vigilant. They're honing their ability to anticipate by scanning the environment and signals for, for, for change. Um, they also have a tendency to, to want to study failure, um, you know, of, of their own and then also of their team, you know, in a constructive way, you know, try to find the hidden hidden lessons in that. And, and that sort of as a, as a business coach, this is part of why this is, I believe, what's why it's part of my leadership style, because I'm helping clients look at the company from a big picture and sort of saying, where do we and try to anticipate what areas that they need to look at to be able to fix, to grow or to pay attention at that particular time. Now, the second one that the, this was also one that was sort of my leadership style as well was that of the transformation transformational leadership. And these people are always working to improve upon the status quo and push their team to grow and to reach outside their comfort zone. To me, that sounds like that's, that's my job as a business coach is, is, is push you outside your comfort zone to, but, but to just really, it's, it's all about expanding your comfort zone. So you have more areas to work and more variety that you could sit down and look at. So this type of leadership is greatly desired among growth-minded companies because it motivates employees to see what they're capable of. Uh, but on the other end, one potential downfall is the transformational leaders can risk losing sight of everyone's individual learning curve of how people learn. So it's, it's really, it's especially important to correct that type of coaching and, and um, is to correct that type of coaching and direction if it isn't provided. And that's why I think the, my two leadership styles of strategic leadership and transformational leadership work really well together within that. Then the last, the next one, there's a couple more to go, is transactional leadership. So trans, this is perhaps really the most common types of leaders is these managers uh, reward employees for precisely the work they're expected to do. These leaders, um, lean on things like scheduled bonuses, staying within a status quo or a specific timetable, getting things done on time. Transactional leadership helps establish roles and responsibilities for each employee, but then, or at least communicates that if they're not the ones creating it, and then encourages employees to stick to doing, um, or I guess one of the, the, the weaknesses is it, when, when we just sort of have these specific roles, we, it, it also encourages employees to just stick within just doing the bare minimum. Sometimes that's work. Sometimes that go, is good, you know, on 
when you have a crew that's going out and 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 working on a a landscape project you you want the the foreman to be a transactional leadership is getting everybody to do what they need to do on that but then there's times at you know where the the person that's over operations they can be more the transformational leadership or the strategic leadership on how they do it and and then at that point get the input from the guys on the crew so it doesn't so in the in our team we need to have a variety of leadership styles based on the task at hand and then the 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 last one that we're going to talk about is the bureaucratic leadership um so another way of, of phrasing this is the uh, is traditional old school uh, thing that, that i think of when i'm when i'm talking about this is the uh is the drill sergeant, right? Is these uh, leaders, they go by the books. They might listen and con consider input of their employees, but they tend to reject the ideas if they conflict with any company policy um, um, of, of past practices. So they, okay, this is the way we do things. I don't care how, how you've done it over there. This is how we do things here. So, but employees under this leadership style might not, uh, feel as controlled as they would under an autocratic leadership where they're just boom being told what to do but there is still a lack of freedom in how much people are able to do within their roles so this type of leadership um, could lead to a discouragement and a lack of innovation and sometimes ambitious growth oriented companies would definitely want to avoid this type of leadership but within certain roles and tasks within an organization, it makes sense. But, and, and again, it really depends on what the specific role is and what the specific task is at hand that we need to, where we need to lead our team and what part of the team. So, so those are just, so does everybody have, just a, if you can a raise a hand is a, uh, a better understanding of what your leadership style is and what that means. Because we have, we have to adapt our leadership style based on the circumstances. So during our, never, ever, our normal everyday operations of our business, one leadership style might pose very well. But now once we kick into crisis mode, now we need to pick up our communication, our leadership language and change it to the moment at hand. We need to become adaptive leaders based and, and situational leaders is really where we're going with this is, is what we need. So, so we need to work on better communication. Um, and, and the way we do this is, is uh, those that have been with me for a while, you know that what I always say is communication is the response that you get. If you're communicating and you don't get the expected response that you want, what is happening is you are not communicating in a way that the recipient is fully understanding or aware of or will act upon. So we need to change our communication to meet their style. So, so when it comes down to thinking about this is regardless of the type of leadership style that you fall into, we know that there are aspects that you should always be trying to improve. So, you know, perhaps the, the, and really the most important one is communication and how we communicate. Because we have to be able to communicate clearly and succinctly to be able to explain goals, to explain tasks, and everything in between, if you really think about it. So this means mastering all forms of communication. How do we deal with somebody on a one-on-one -on -one basis? We might need to communicate differently there based on what their um, communication style is or departmental staff wide um, as well as proper etiquette um, for communication via phone email and social media because if we can communicate by phone or by text or by email and those are very shortened types of communication so we might not be meaning anything but we just boom we just say the point just to get it quickly off of our um, off of our plate, pass it on to someone else, but they might read more into it because they don't know where you're coming from or misinterpret what you said. 
So that's really where it really comes back to it. So a large part of communication and communicating well involves creating a really this open and steady flow of communication from your team and really creating an environment of trustworthiness and positive feedback so when people choose to, to come with you with, with ideas, and I see well, the, a lot of the people that are on this call, we've already created that um, within your teams when we've done our team alignment days and, and, and those things is because those are really designed to help focus um, uh, how we communicate better to others. And tools that we've used within that is the the disc and now i'm using a lot of the disc motivators profiles because it helps us understand what our communication style is so we can better communicate to them and then the motivators is the is sort of like the icing on the cake is understanding where their motivation is coming from so we can communicate in a way that is congruent to their communication style if that makes sense so there's a few things that everyone can really benefit from and, um, and, and working on in terms of their communication. So sometimes is, you know, can, can we get better at reading our body language of those that we're talking to? Some, some people, this comes very intuitively. Some people, we have to work on it. Um, maybe reducing the ambiguity, uh, ambigu uh, ambiguity, as I sort of talked about before, between written and spoken languages, between sending a Twitter post out or an email or a text message and whatnot. And then also learning about active listening. How can we become better active listeners? And, 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 and again, this is where I use the DISC and motivators assessment as, as well as other different assessments of, with my clients and, and their teams to help them understand their communication styles. And I mean, some of you, we've used the DISC uh, profiles to help people to understand how to better communicate to their prospects so they could uh, really help gain trust and support of their clients more quickly and be able to close more sales. So, so the next thing after better communication is, is we need to keep our team motivated. I don't like using the word motivated. I like to, it's more what we need to keep our team inspired and enrolled. Uh, because what I always like to say is, uh, you, know, you know, what happens when you motivate an idiot? You get a motivated idiot, right? So our job is not motivation. Motivation is we need to in, in, uh, light up the motivation within each and one of our, within ourselves and with our employees. So as a, as, as a leader, our job is to inspire our workers to go that extra mile, to build that self-esteem along the way. And how do we do that is by getting them to enroll in the vision of the company of, of what we're trying to do, why we do what we do. And it, because this will help them to continue to really stay loyal um, to their to, uh, to their workplace, to, to increase their investment in the success of the company as a whole. Um, and, you know, you need to believe in your vision and then, and, and make it their vision as well. And because if once we do that, then we start getting really 100% buy-in. So, so to keep a team inspired or, or motivated, we, we need to show them that we're committed to them. We need to be asking for their feedback. We need to be really listening to their concerns, recognizing them in front of the team. You know, that's a, you know, well, the team recognition is, is really important. Understanding the differences between each of our team members' work styles, their personalities, um, and, and appreciate those differences. Um, and, and basically just sort of sometimes just saying thank you for the, the work that they're doing. And especially this time where everybody is sort of stepping out. And then the, the, the last thing I really sort of want to talk about is practicing our ability to delegate and and we need to and when we need to i'm not going to spend a lot of time here but there's a difference between delegating and abdicating abdicating means you're giving over responsibility that you're not responsible for this and more that you don't care how that person does it until they do it wrong and then you yell at them so and why and why are you yelling at them because they're not doing it the way 
you want to, but it's not their fault. You haven't told them how you wanted it. There's no systems in place and stuff. So, you know, one of the um, common mistakes that we see among young leaders as we're trying to grow other leaders underneath us is they try to do everything themselves. They don't like try to, to delegate it because, you know, a lot of times and for some business owners as well is um, I've talked about this a lot in the past is they have this Superman mentality that they have to come in to whatever problem there is and whoosh, they fly in to save the day. And instead of creating a team of problem solvers that can help a client quicker and probably more efficient than the owner can. So why do owners do this is um, have the Superman mentality. It's, it, it's, it's a way of, for them to having um, increasing their own self-worth because they haven't really defined what their job is as a business owner. They've always been the problem solver in the company. Always, everyone's always been able to do that. But we need to shift from being the problem solver and the doer of the business to be the one that leads and inspires the team to create happy customers and, and, and so on. So you know, when we sit down and we identify, we, so we need to identify skills among our employees and then assigning them duties based on those skills. Um, you know, you know, are they smart? Are they strategic? Are they resource, uh, resourceful? And, and who can take on this added responsibility? And sometimes we need to add, we have to get, take the risk and give somebody a responsibility and see if they step up to that. You know, and so sometimes we have to be creative in the way we assign responsibility and then ask for the best way for uh, uh, feedback on the best way that uh, to do a task because they might be better at doing that task than you are. So they might have some better suggestions to be more efficient and more effective because you've been doing it the same way forever. And it could be because that works and you've done trial and error. They need to understand that. But so they need to understand your way of doing it. And then we can look at how do we fix this process. So, and then, and, the, and this really, the, it's really, it's all about creating trust among the, the employees that they're going to do the job. And, and when, uh, and this trust is when you give over to others, maybe the parts of handling a larger job um, in the business. And then this is gonna then boost up their self esteem and feeling more involved and sort of really being open, having more open encouragement and communication along the way. So nobody really feels overwhelmed with added responsibilities and, and, and whatnot. So I, I really appreciate everybody coming in. Hopefully that you guys have, the, everybody that's uh, been on the live webinar and then those that will be watching it later um, on, the, on the recorded webinar is, is really is understand the difference is, is the boss has the title a leader has the people. How do we get the, the, and a lot of it has to do with the types of leadership language that we use, but it has to be situational in itself. So again, um, I appreciate everything here is a, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us um, and, and really take out, I uh, know everybody's busy out of their schedule and I love absolutely being able to, to give over this information. Hopefully you've gotten some valuable stuff. If you want to take what you learned off of this session of the people that have been on this live um, session um, compared to the, those that uh, are watching and recording, call my office and schedule a free strategy session to sort of see how you can do or, or coach you through what leadership situations that you need to use some of these different um, leadership languages, if you will. So uh, I appreciate it again. Hope everybody has a good day. Um, stay safe, be healthy, and be abundant. Help everybody out there. So again, thank you very much. Uh, my phone number is down here for those that need it. Uh, also, check out my website. And on the website too, there's a lot of free resources going on right now with the COVID-19 to help uh, business owners as well. Yeah, everybody have an awesome day. We'll talk to you soon and be well. Have a great, have a great day.